I'd like to thank the organizers for having me. We're going to talk about the role of imaging and in patients treated with intraortic balloon pumping. I have no relationships to disclose with respect to this talk. So the goals are to talk about the physiology of and the rationale for intraortic balloon pump use in circulatory support. We'll talk about imaging and assessment of balloon pump placement and also assessment of function. And there really isn't all that much echocardiographic imaging of intraortic balloon placements, as you'll see in the talk. So I'm going to take a little bit of time to give you a general introduction to some of the precepts that are involved in echocardiographic imaging in shock. This is a slide of the type of hemodynamic support. As you can see, it can be temporary, it can be destabilized, which are triage, the support organ function, or it can be permanent. And there are devices on the right. There's in the middle, there are, we talk about it in terms of bridge. And what you can see is that intraortic balloon pumping is temporary support, and it's really almost always designed as a bridge to recovery. Indications for support are on this side. Probably the most common indication is cardiogenic shock after MI, either due to pump failure or to various mechanical complications that are associated with myocardial infarction. I'm going to show you a couple of those later in the talk. After uh, cardiotomy and bypass surgery, you might have failure to wean off bypass and you might need a balloon pump or alternatively, you might do this prophylactically uh, in a patient having some hemodynamic trouble. Patients with decompensated chronic heart failure may be treated with balloon pumping, pumping either those who are transplant eligible or those who are not, in which case this is a uh, designed durable therapy story for another day. Patients with myocarditis and ventricular arrhythmias may need some hemodynamic support as well. Here's an intraortic balloon. It's the intraortic balloon pump, but it, it is a counter pulsation device. It inflates in diastole, as you can see on the left side of the diagram and that increases diastolic perfusion pressure and coronary perfusion pressure, uh, and thus uh, facilitates coronary perfusion. And then it deflates in systole when this inflated balloon suddenly deflates it, if you will, sucks the blood out of the heart and reduces left ventricular afterload. This machine is mechanical, it's powered by electricity, so these effects occur without an increase in oxygen demand. There are a couple of contraindications to intraortic balloon pumping, the most common of which being significant aortic regurgitation, not just mild, but moderate severe aortic regurgitation, not the time you want to be pumping blood back at raising diastolic pressure and pushing more blood back in the heart. Peripheral vascular issues can make it difficult to get the balloon pump where you need and can cause potential ischemia downstream. If you have an aortic aneurysm, you, exact, you don't exactly want to be banging away at it with a balloon inflating and deflating. And bleeding in infectious conditions can make you think twice about putting in an intraortic balloon pump. So this is a slide that talks about the uh, effects of intraaortic balloon pumping. Um, as you can see, it's a volume displacement pump. It produces, provides about half a liter per minute of cardiac output. Um, so that's not a lot. It's only 500 cc's. Its main effect, as you can see in the pressure volume loop, is to decrease left ventricular pressure, to decrease afterload. I won't go into detail on this diagram, but the slope of that arterial elastance goes down. That's a measure of afterload. You decrease stroke work as the curve pressure volume loop goes to the left, that's decreased stroke work, thus decreasing myocardial oxygen demand. And the balloon pump doesn't make the heart work any better, it just decreases its load. So how do we image balloon pumping? Well, the, the device is usually implanted under fluoroscopic guidance, that's usually in the catheterization laboratory, but it can be done at the bedside you estimate the distance between the groin and the sternal notch sort of by putting the, the balloon pump on the outside and kind of figuring out how far you're going to have to put this thing in. The actual position is really evaluated by radiography. And where you want it is shown in the diagram. As you can see in the diagram, you have the subclavian arteries coming off and you have the renal arteries coming off. So you don't want it too high so as to avoid the possibility of occluding the subclavian artery. And you don't want it too low so as to avoid the possibility of occluding the renal arteries. So you thought this was to talk about echo imaging, right? Well, stay tuned a little bit. Here is a uh, X-ray of an intraortic balloon pump positioned. You can actually see a femoral swan in there, but the red arrow shows the intraortic balloon pump. You want to position it at the at the carina, which is roughly equivalent to the place in the aorta where the subclavian puts off. And this is 
uh, perfectly placed. If you're looking on the outside, the carina and the sternal notch are roughly in the same place, which is why externally you position it to the sternal notch. So here's a picture where the balloon pump is too high. So the carina is, the blue arrow is where the carina is. And if you see the red arrow, this thing is all the way up in the ascending aortic arch. And that is a balloon pump that really is, uh, has the potential to occlude subclavian flow and impair cerebral perfusion. This one's a little bit too low. It takes a little bit of, of uh, looking to find this catheter. It is where the red arrow is. You can sort of see that this thing is bending out to the right. Uh, making you wonder a little bit whether it's actually in the aorta itself. I'm going to show you that it is in the next slide, but this is what sort of catheter that's too low and may very well be compromising bilateral renal perfusion. Here's the catheter when it gets advanced, and you can kind of see it's a tortuous aorta, some of those that makes it challenging to get the balloon pump in at all, takes a turn to the left, back to the right. Um, there it is up on top. This is actually probably a little bit too high where, where this chest x-ray was taken. Uh, I'd like to thank my colleague, Dr. Kennisberg, for providing both of these slides, as well as this echocardiographic picture. I am going to show you an echo. You actually can see the balloon in the descending aorta, uh, but this is what it looks like. What you see is the left ventricle here and the left atrium and the aortic valve and the aorta, the right ventricle is up on top. And that round structure that behind the atrium is the descending aorta. And you can see in the red arrow, there's this echo dense thing that's popping around in there. So the echocardiogram will tell you that something's in the descending aorta and that's the balloon pump. But the echo, as you can see, doesn't really tell you exactly where it is. So you do actually want to look at the waveform and try to figure out whether the balloon pump is in the right place. Although I have to say the current algorithms make this pretty easy to do. But if you go to the left, normally you have a non-augmented systolic pressure. You want to time this to the dichrotic notch because that's when the aortic valve closes. And so then you have augmented diastolic pressure. And then the next beat, this is a two to one. So every other beat is balloon pump assisted. In this example, the next beat, the aortic and diastolic pressure is reduced. That's an, that's an indication of decreased afterload, and that also reduces the systolic pressure. So this is normally, you want it right at the dichrotic notch, and the abnormal things are on the right. If you have early inflation, the balloon gets in the way of ejection. You don't want that to happen. If you have late inflation uh, on the right, you don't really get very much augmentation. Again, if you deflate too early uh, or too late, you don't get maximal effect with the balloon. All that said, the timing algorithms on the balloon are really, really sophisticated and much better. And the number of uh, occasions on which you have to manually adjust the timing of the balloon is it's pretty uncommon these days. What about the data? Well, here are the data from the uh, uh, shock, IABP shock 2 trial out of Germany. This is a trial of 600 patients with cardiogenic shock due to acute MI randomized to intraaortic balloon pumping or not, along with percutaneous coronary intervention, a relatively common population for acute MI with shock, mean age of 70, two thirds of male, they were hypotensive uh, and almost uh, with a mean heart rate of 92. And the primary endpoint of this trial was 30 day mortality. It was powered for a 12% decrease in mortality from 56% to 44%. Um, and what you see, is that, uh, it's that there's no difference between balloon pumping and control in this trial. Now, a couple of caveats. The balloon, pumping was put in, the balloon pump was put in after PCI in 87%, and maybe the PCI improved function, and maybe you didn't need the balloon at all those patients. 10% of the controls crossed over to balloon pumping. Um, and the use of assist devices was uncommon in this trial, but it was about twice as common in the control group as in the intraaortic balloon pump. So certainly no data supporting the use of balloon pump but may, may or may not be the last word. And one of the reasons for this is that counterpulsation requires pulsation. And this is a study that looked at patients um, and they measured cardiac power. So cardiac power is basically the power that the motor of the heart is putting out. It's the pressure, it's the systolic pressure times the stroke volume, how much power that ventricle is pulling out. And they divided patients into low and high baseline power. And what you can see is that if you had high baseline power, most of the patients stabilized with an intraaortic balloon pump. But if your baseline power was low, then actually more patients, about two thirds of the patients decompensated. So the principle is that the more dysfunctional the ventricle is, the less the intraaortic balloon pump helps. 
Now, I just showed you data that the balloon pump doesn't help. It's actually, there really aren't very many data with any of the other mechanical support devices. This is two, uh, two graphs. The first is from a, a, a study, a meta-analysis put out in the European Heart Journal in 2017, looking at 30-day uh, mortality in various trials, uh, uh, some with balloon pumping and some with impella. Uh, you can see that the numbers are relatively small, but there's no benefit here. And the second is uh, a page, uh, a comparison of patients in the European impella registry. So there are registry data suggesting good outcomes with impellas. And so uh, they took matched pairs from the shock two trial with anterior balloon pumping and matched them to the impella registry and said, you know something, they're really, you really can't find much difference in mortality between uh, impella and intraaortic balloon pumping. So I come not to compare balloon pump, pump with impella, but, but rather to tell you that we really need more data on which devices are most effective in which settings. So why use intraaortic balloon pumping if the data don't support it? Well, it's easy to insert rapidly. It's not that expensive compared to other mechanical circulatory support devices. Runs about five or six hundred dollars. It augments diastolic pressure and thus coronary perfusion pressure. So if your problem is myocardial ischemia, then it may well be a good thing to do. If your problem is cardiac output, remember your output only goes up by half a liter. Maybe you need something else. And it does reduce afterload a little. And so sometimes that little reduction in afterload may be enough. All right, switching gears away from balloon pump, let's talk about echocardiography. So here are the things that you can measure with echocardiography. You can measure left ventricular size and overall performance. You can measure regional wall motion abnormalities. You can assess right ventricular size and right ventricular function. You can see how big the atria are. You can take a look at the valves. You can look at the pericardium. In particular, look for a pericardial infusion. Uh, with Dopplers, you can measure stroke volume. I'm gonna show you that in a second. You can estimate pulmonary systolic pressure and you can get a sense of the severity of valvular stenosis and regurgitation using color Doppler and also uh, various Doppler measures. And perhaps a story for another day, uh, echocardiography with Doppler is a way to assess diastolic performance. Here's the measurement of stroke volume. And the idea is that the aorta is conceived of as a cylinder here and the stroke volume is conceived of a slug of blood with something called a stroke distance. So you have a cylinder, you have it moving a stroke distance on each beat, that's your stroke volume. So the area of the cylinder is pi r squared. So if you measure the diameter, you take the diameter uh, divided by two, so that's pi times the diameter squared over four, or diameter squared times 0.765, this is just the math. And the stroke volume, the, uh, the stroke distance is measured by the velocity time integral across the aortic outflow tract. So if you take those two together, you get an estimate of stroke volume. I think this is important because it means in any well done transthoracic echocardiogram, you can generate a stroke volume, multiply by heart rate, and calculate a cardiac output. It's a snapshot of the cardiac output. If you do it again, you get cardiac output at two different times. So here's a study to show that TTE can identify the causes of shock. They looked at, this is from 2004, long, long ago. They looked at 100 consecutive cases of shock in whom an order is echoed, and they wound up with 63% cardiac causes. Um, the rest of the study is just a little bit, or maybe even a lot too good to be true. Image quality deemed adequate, 99%, sensitivity of 100, specificity. Uh, it's, it's a little hard to believe that, but I think the study does make the point that uh, that it is useful to do transthoracic echocardiography in patients with shock. In patients with cardiogenic shock, you get many of the same things, but it's a little more focused. You want overall function, but you also want regional systolic function. You want to know whether there are regional wall motion abnormalities. You want to know whether there's evidence of previous infarction with fibrosis and thinning. Uh, echocardiography, probably the best and most expeditious way to diagnose mechanical causes of shock. Uh, either papillary muscle muscle rupture, acute VSD, or free wall rupture. You can tell the degree of mitral regurgitation. You can see right ventricular infarction by a big dilated right ventricle. And you can look at other causes of shock, tamponade, pulmonary embolism, or valvular stenosis. Here's a picture of a free wall rupture along with pathology, which you see is a hematoma outside the left ventricle with a pseudoaneurysm. Um, here's an atrial septal defect. That's that defect in between the left ventricle and the right ventricle, and you can see color Doppler with flow coming into from the left ventricle into the right ventricle and a pathologic specimen. 
Papillary muscle rupture can also be seen by echo. This turns out to be a transesophageal echo with the left atrium on top of the left ventricle. And you can see the green arrow shows a hunk of papillary muscle that's been torn off. And on the bottom, you have colored Doppler showing posterior directed severe mitral regurgitation. So take home points for the talk. Intraortic balloon calter pulsation is relatively easy to implement and can help support coronary perfusion pressure and to some extent reduce afterload in patients with cardiogenic shock. Echocardiography is not especially useful in evaluating the intraortic balloon pump itself, but expeditious echocardiographic assessment is invaluable in the differential diagnosis of shock and can be highly useful in its management as well. Focused ultrasound is often a good place to start, but I hope you have a sense of how complicated this can be, and a more comprehensive assessment is usually warranted. How might this talk change your practice? Well, I hope you have a better understanding of how and when to use intraortic balloon pumping, uh, and I hope you can improve your use of echocardiography to evaluate patients with cardiogenic shock, and also to have some sense of when to ask for help. Thank you.